So I was telling you. Mm, what were you telling me? That uh, last night. I wasn't preaching today, so no. I didn't have any. Uh, didn't have to go to bed early because I get up super early when I'm preaching. And um, what time did you go to bed? I don't know. No, for real. You've, I, been, I, you, you, you've been typically going to bed at a like, oh, yeah. decent hour. So yeah, I mean, I would think okay, even if you weren't preaching, like eleven o'clock. I don't. I have. I literally have no idea when I went to bed because it didn't matter. I All didn't right, so it was three. It. I it wasn't three. Two. Might have been two. Might have been one. I know I saw the end of the UFC fight. Oh, so that'd have been midnight. I, uh, you know, uh, good. So I don't know. Yeah, I didn't watch it. I know because I was preaching today. I was like, mm, yeah. Mm. I stayed up. I said, but you know what I did watch? I I went back and I watched a 2001 classic, 24 season one. Well, I watched a couple of episodes of it. Awesome. Twenty. I was telling Killian about it. He's like, what's 24? Such a good show. And I was telling Catherine, they'd never heard of it. And I'm like, no. And so I told him, I go, well, it's it's called 24 because the whole season happens in one 24 hour period of time. So it's one day. And they go, oh, the whole thing happens in one day. I go, yeah. And every episode happens in real time. So you get. You Except get, for travel. <laughs> well, <laughs> technically, played. they're saying that it all maps up. Okay. All right. they, I, I never using, looked at it. Using it. helicopters. And so when they go to commercial break, four minutes have passed. Like they work really hard to keep it all mm-hmm. in, in real time, which is why there are so many helicopter rides. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, and they were fascinated by the idea. Like, oh, I hadn't even heard of this. It's so weird how much how things pass quickly. Like, yeah. to me, like twenty four doesn't feel like that long ago. But that was uh, twenty years ago. It was such an original, yeah. Like, in a lot, I mean, pioneering yeah, in a lot no, of ways, right? Finally, something original and mm-hmm. fun. What was cool was uh, we had just bought our first home. It was a townhouse, and Jen was in Germany, so I was painting the place and moving us in while she was gone. Okay. And so uh, at night, I was like, I'm in, I have nothing to do. I'm just sitting on a mattress on the floor, and so I, I, I rented twenty four. It had, it had come oh. out. And uh, so I got season one and started watching it, and I was like, this "It's is hard. So it's hard fun. not to binge." Yeah, it's pretty hard to. You have to at least watch a couple. There's no way you're gonna get away with just one. No, and no. one turns into two, turns into three, mm-hmm. turns into you stay up till three. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you got to find because they, they leave it on cliffhangers, and then you finally get one like, "Okay, I, I can wait for tomorrow." I, for can, the next I, can, I can wait, on but the sometimes next you're like, "No, I can't wait. I gotta nope. do this." And wait, Jack just cut that guy's thumb off so he can get into the the fingerprint scanner in mm-hmm. the other room <laughs> i'm not that we're advocating we're not we're not torture wow that's what are you watching i've not seen this you know why people were so pro that movie and so for the torture thing at that point oh yeah 2001 yeah yeah people yep. were like yes <laughs> get those bad guys i don't care what it takes by any means <laughs> so anyway now that was the that was the newest thing it was kind of an old thing but it was a new thing for me mm, that's nice you know and then you know what happened last night What's that? So like, Jen was like, uh, my wife, she was like, uh, like, what are we having for dinner? She's like, oh, I got some ground beef. We're going to do some pasta thing. I don't know what it is. You know, maybe taco pasta or something. I was like, okay, cool. Um, and then- Wait, uh, say it again? Taco pasta. It's it's like a, it's got a, it's what she calls it. It's got some flavoring in it. It's, I don't know. But it's good. But what, taco pasta? So it's pasta, but it's got the flavor, the, the, the ground beef flavoring that would be more okay. akin to what you're doing with a taco. Okay, you know? okay. Uh, cheese and onion and cilantro and all that okay. stuff. Okay, all right, all right. And uh, and it's good. Everybody likes it. What kind of noodles? Uh, it depends. I, I don't know what she had. She had some other kind of noodle. She was like, well, I don't know. We're just going to make it happen. And uh, But I was like, I wasn't really, I wasn't feeling taco pasta, mm. you know, so I, I had a little something before, and I thought maybe I'll have a little taco pasta when it's time. What'd you have before? I don't know, soup or something. Soup and bread. Okay. But then, but then my dad was like, I'm not going to eat tonight. And then everybody was like, oh, nobody's going to eat. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just make breakfast for dinner i know how much you hate that i love breakfast for dinner oh really it's like one of my favorite things i wouldn't have eaten the soup <laughs> i wouldn't have eaten the soup and the bread and all that if i knew we were gonna have breakfast sausage and pancake like come on hash browns all seriously right. bro it sounds like you so missed then out. i had to get make myself sick because i can't skip that i had to eat extra or maybe next time, just be thankful for whatever she's going to give you and don't pre-eat. I was thankful. I was thankful. And don't pre-eat. Yeah. I made a mistake. See, you pre-ate oh, no, so I you did. wouldn't eat. Yeah. I was, I was going to eat a little. I'll have a little bit of taco. But no, you didn't want to at all. No, I, I, I wanted a little bit. That's fine. But I was like, I was really hungry. So you weren't thankful for what she was going to do. I was thankful. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. 
I wasn't thank full. I wasn't full of thanks. I was, <laughs> I was like thank half full. I was like I, I was thank adjacent. Yeah, I was. You know, it was there were some thanks. <laughs> there were some thanks in there. It's funny because she's such a good cook. And when we got married, she couldn't cook anything. She didn't know how to cook anything. She learned how to cook a whole chicken from her mom in Germany because it's Germany. It's like basically yeah, yeah. it's like you know wooden shoes and whole chickens. Like I don't know what they do over there. And then, um, but then she just started learning all these recipes, and she's really good. So uh, I'm, I'm, I am very thankful. Man, I've really gotten into chicken, like roasted chicken. Because mm. growing up, it was always dry. Uh, it was never good. So I'm like, I don't want chicken. Yeah, I don't why want would chicken. you? But now, because Michelle makes it really well, mm-hmm. and we get the uh, household farm chickens. Yeah, real chickens. Oh, I got so many. I was thinking about that. Like, um, like there were a lot of dishes I did not, I hated growing up. And then John's like, oh, I'm going to make this. Brussels sprouts, meatloaf. Mm-hmm. I can think of a bunch of things, and I'm like, ew. These are terrible things. And But when she made them, I was like, holy smokes, these are really good. <laughs> very, yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah. You know. All righty. Mm. Well, listen, uh, we got a, we got an email. We did. Yeah, a very long one from a pastor, Pastor Tom. Um, and so it's a long, long one. I've edited it down quite a bit, Ooh. but we still have a fair bit to read here. But I want us to read. I want you guys to hear this so that when we start talking about it, we can kind of figure out, you know. Well, this will be the context in which we're trying to address the issue because the issue is bigger than just this one person situation. Mm. But the subject is the restoration of sexual offenders. It says this. Hey, brothers, I wanted to quickly say how much I appreciate ministry of D&D. I especially appreciate the way you guys attempt to be fair and balanced when it comes to very difficult topics. You don't tend to be particularly committed to any type of tribal commitments, which is very refreshing in our day. That being said, I do have a very complicated question that I'm facing as a pastor of our church. About six months ago, a man who is on parole for a sex offense with a minor, in this case a teenager, reached out to me to have lunch. He is listed on the sex offenders registry as well. Over that lunch, he shared with me his story and how he had been working through restoration over the past seven years since being released from prison. He is well connected with pastors from a well-grounded church in another city several hours away, as I mentioned above. This gentleman who is in his upper 60s, has not participated meaningfully in local church for well over 15 years. He inquired about what it might look like for him to get back into the local church under his circumstances. We decided to get him connected to one of our men's groups led by one of our elders until we can get to know him better and process next steps. We are encouraged he has been getting well connected with those men and building friendship. But, like I assume you would agree, he needs the whole church as he continues to walk with Christ. His testimony is strong. We see no evidence that his testimony is fake. He has sat with our we, he has sat with several of our elders and other trusted men in our church for an extended interview. He shared everything with us that would seem pertinent to the situation at hand. So then he has this, this question, right? He says, "The question that keeps getting batted around among the elders is what is our responsibility to the rest of the church? Should we bring him before the congregation and effectively stamp him with a crimson A or in this case CA?" Uh, on his chest as he comes into fellowship as a guest? Should we move him straight to membership so that he can share his story with the church from the beginning? Or do we allow him to visit under close care from our elders and those men I mentioned above? I would love to know how you guys would think through this process. Perhaps you have faced something like this in the past. With the recent report by Julie Roys on the former pastor who had been allowed to attend her former church, one of the statements that she has made is that if there's true repentance in the offender's life, he will not want to go to church in an effort to not put himself in a tempting situation. But I'm not so sure that is the appropriate biblical response. If indeed our theology and ecclesiology believes the local church is essential to gospel life, presents and witness it, would seem to me that we must find a way for this man to participate in the body of Christ in a meaningful way. But we also recognize as shepherds, we have a sacred responsibility to our flock. Am I wrong? Mm. So let's say at the outset, we have not had to deal with this particular situation where somebody who has, who is a convicted, uh, you know, abuser of a child, uh, sexual assault of some kind have come to the church and wants to plug in. We have not been put in that situation. No, not, nope. But we do think about this because we read about it all the time. And by the way, by the way, oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, all the hate that Julie Roy's gets for constantly, in their terms, harping on this issue of like another pastor, another deacon, another elder, another preacher. Uh, I'm actually grateful that she's doing that yeah. because uh, I mean it's 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 a shameful reality. It's a painful reality. But I would rather the truth be known um, because this stuff happens. It happens a lot. 
Now, I'm not saying that it's the norm. I'm not saying it happens in every church, but it happens enough that it warrants like attention being given to it. And mm. when you when you do this sort of a awful, evil offense, uh, yeah, there needs to be accountability and people need to know because these guys are so frequently just repurposed and plugged into another congregation somewhere when once they get the chance. Yep. So I don't have a problem with what she's doing at all. Um, I'm fine with that. All right. So how would we, in a situation like this, begin to think about it? So like, I don't, I'm not comfortable saying this is what we would do, but these are the issues I think that the elders would take very seriously, right? And it, we basically boil it down to two things. We'd have to care for that individual and we have to care for the congregation. Yep. Both. Both of them. Right. Because we, we have to hold that intention. Mm -hmm, this person's made in the, in the image of God. They are a, confess, a professing believer. They are confessing their wrongs. They are demonstrating repentance. So we want to treat the individual with dignity. Like I, I know, listen, because I know as a guy who was like sexually abused as a kid, I know like the, and just somebody in general who's sensitive, we, we, we have this impulse like to punish. You mm. hurt somebody that was mm -hmm. little. You hurt somebody that was little who couldn't defend themselves. We want to destroy. Like that's yep. an impulse that we have. Yep. And sex offenders know that that is the impulse. Like they, that's why they're afraid to go to gen pop uh, in prison. Like mm -hmm. I've talked to a guy that was going into gen pop. He was terrified because they're going to find out why he's there. Um, so they know that. And I'm not saying that that's right. It's just, it is a reality that in us, like we have this tendency that way. But so we've got a guard against saying like, well, I just, we want to throw them away. We want to guard against that. We want to guard against uh, a desire to punish them. Uh, we want to treat them with dignity and and try to to serve them in a way that's going to help them be the best Christian that they can be in whatever circumstance they're going to exist. Mm. So when we're talking then about caring about the individual, right? Uh, like you said, you know, we want to treat that individual with dignity because they are made in the image of God. Um, but we we need to though provide support and resources for them. Yeah. Like we need to help them grow in grace to put sin to death yep. and to address any underlying issues that led to their crimes that yeah, led yeah. to that. I mean, it's, it's the same thing for, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's the same thing for all of us, right? Addressing the hard issues mm -hmm. that we all need to be addressing. Yeah. This one though, takes quite a bit of intentionality Ooh. and transparency yeah. and accountability because of what's at stake. Yeah. The, the, the sins are so grievous in nature. They have done so much damage and harm. Mm-hmm primarily to the victim but these sins also do damage to your own heart to your own soul like you become jaded in, in so many different ways mm -hmm. so uh and it's i think it's just easier for us to be like ah oh, you know what just give them a bible and then we'll put some protocols in place if they're going to do something and lock it down like yeah you, you actually have to have a heart that loves sinners like god does you have to say like i love this person if you can't say I love this person, hmm. because if you can't say that in light of them having gone too far, then you do not have the heart of God in this. And it's not okay to go like, well, no, I don't have the heart of God. God has the heart of God. That's why we need the gospel. Granted, yes, but you're supposed to cultivate the heart of God. You're supposed yeah. to you're supposed to love like God loves. And if you can't, man, if you can't love the person who's done the most incredible, incredibly unimaginable thing. Uh, then you're you're not going to be in a position to actually care for them at all. Mm. I'm not saying that's easy, and I'm certainly not saying that we do this and neglect the victims. That's not at all the point. No, but you've no. got to. So, like, what are some things, just in general, that we that we should do if we're trying to care for somebody, lead somebody who has has gone down this particular sinful path? What are some things that uh, that a church leadership should be looking to implement or or help them with? Well, I think looking at their discipleship, like like as this brother just said, yeah. you know, getting them involved in a certain group, in a group that they could be discipled, that they could mm. uh, find that encouragement where they've got other uh, uh, other brothers in this case mm -hmm. that are uh, keeping an eye on them, rebuking them, mm -hmm. right? Um, pointed them to the gospel, pointed yeah. them to their their need uh, for Jesus, yeah. encouraging them, strengthening them. Right? It's it's not all. Uh, it's not all doom and gloom, right? It's listen, this is a hard, dark reality that they are into. And it's listen, their life is going to be marked by this. They're going to, they're going to yeah, forever. Yeah. The, they're, until the resurrection, man, there are some things that we do that are so devastating that you, you never escape the consequences until death. They're just with you. Mm -hmm. And that is a reality here, but there, but you want men around them, or if it's a woman, women around them that will not only hold them accountable and rebuke them when they need it, 
but we'll also encourage them and help them to find the joy of the Lord. We, we, we should want them to have that hmm. and to experience some kind of freedom. I think counseling, right? Yeah, we, yeah. We, we're big believers in this at Redeemer, and we utilize all kinds of counselors um, depending on the situation. But uh, people, people do need professional help, and if the church can assist in that financially, great. Um, if not, then like look for whatever resources you can, uh, support groups, Whatever, but you, hmm. but the, the, on the front end here, and this is the smallest portion of what we want to talk about is you're going to have to care for that individual care, actually care, right? Not just put in protocols. Mm-hmm. You have to seek their good. They're flourishing if you're going to do it, if yeah. it's possible to do. All right. All right. But then we got to care for the con- congregation. And uh, Jimmy. And again, I mean, for us, we've not gone through this. So we're, no. we're sort of processing out loud. Right. Kind of what are those things that we've, we've batted around. We've mm-hmm. kind of talked about it a little bit. Uh, and because we've not gone through this, one of the things we're definitely going to want to do is consult experts. We don't want to wing it. No. Well, this but, is, we're pretty is, smart. This is not something to I wing. I've written books, Jimmy. Oh yeah, I, I know you have. <laughs> I know you have. But this is definitely not something that we just wing. And I have throw a Bible. There. It, the Bible nope. is inerrant. No. Inspired. I, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I agree with you. Consult some experts. <laughs> what Could, kind of experts? Uh, I'd be consulting with lawyers, mm-hmm. uh, counselors. Yep. Uh, understand like those specific risks and considerations that are involved in this individual's case. Yeah, man. It's, I mean, everybody needs to do this. This is just step one of beginning to think through it. Like, go to the experts because you don't know, and even if you do know, every case is different. It's just mm-hmm. you want to protect the church. Yeah, uh, and that doesn't just mean protecting yourself as a pastor or yourselves as the elders you want to protect the whole church yes so yes talk to people who know what they're doing which is probably not you it's definitely not us <laughs> it's not us no that's what we know we know hey we we need to consult an expert all right and and then if you begin to go down this path then you are going to have to clarify boundaries they're going to have to be very clear boundaries yeah right develop guidelines for this person uh in church activities so are you going to limit them to certain areas of the church or certain events um are they able to come to corporate worship um if they are do you do would you require them to have a chaperone with them present at all times Mm -hmm. if it's a person that's been convicted of of sexual abuse of a minor then absolutely uh if they would be allowed into the the church on a sunday on the lord's day they would in my mind, they would have to have a chaperone present with them at all times, everywhere in the building. Yep. Uh, they yep. would only be allowed into the sanctuary, bathroom, accompanied. You know, and I would, I would imagine, I would imagine that uh, if they are humble and, and broken, they're they're not going to object to that. They're going to be thankful for it, mm. at least on some level. Obviously, they're not going to be, you know, having any time with with kids or yeah, they're not, not going to be part of the children's ministry no, by any means. No, they're not going to be anywhere near that. So. You have to have boundaries. You have to think this through. And this is where you're going to want to bring in some people uh, to talk about this, right? And, and not just experts, but even people in the church. Like, so, you got because you might, you know, in, in every individual's church experience, Sunday experience, they tend to have specific habits, like sp- specific paths they walk, things. And so, if you talk to a few different people, you realize, like, oh, I didn't really, I only do this. This is how I kind of function on Sunday. Yeah. Somebody yeah. else be like, well, no, this other people kind of go in this door or they, they hang out over here. Mm. Which is, so you, you want to think through the boundaries that are, you know, likely to be um, safeguards for the church, but also safeguards for the individual. You, know, you want them to have, you want everybody to be safe. And it's not about, it's not about punishing them. It's not about that. It's just about protecting and creating an environment where this is possible, if it's possible. I'm not even, We're not I, even sure, you know. Is it possible? I don't know. I, I The idealist in me, and I know in you, would be yeah. like, well, yeah, of course. Ideally, we want people to be redeemed, reformed, yep. strengthened, yep. sanctified, brought yep. back into the fellowship. But, um, you know, I don't, I, I mean, I don't pretend to know uh, the, 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 let me put it this way. I know that uh, that those who have committed these crimes are have a very difficult time staying out of trouble. Like mm. There is a high recidivism rate. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people who would argue like these people are never cured. So my, the idealist in me would be like, well, okay. That's like saying, well, no one's ever cured of alcoholism. It's like, well, okay, maybe. It depends on how you define it. But, but there are people that are alcoholics who have found freedom from the slave of mm-hmm, alcohol, mm-hmm. right? So however you want to define things, there is still freedom. So I like to I like to think like, well, I think there could be true deliverance from this and real change, but that doesn't mean that therefore you can just take off all the safeguards and boundaries. I, I, I tend to think you can't do that, mm. but I don't know. 
So as you're you're having these boundaries, then you also though should be monitoring for safety, right? Yeah. Uh, the church yeah. then you know. I think it'd be ideal, right? And we want to work through that. How do you establish a system for monitoring the individual's behavior and that their compliance with the church's guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. And is that then, okay, you've got someone that's accompanying them, you chaperone with them the entire time. Like, how do you monitor for safety? Because that that needs to be a part of it. How yeah. that happens, I think it needs to be worked through. But there needs to be the monitoring and something that's that's intentional, Mm -hmm. That's something that's that is intentional um, so that we are protecting you're protecting the church. And I, I would think it, it and not the church name. You're protecting right. the, the, the people, you know, the people within the, the people. church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think like it's got to be investigatory as well, not just ob observational. Right. So it's like when you're present on Sunday, it's observational. You're there. But like Jimmy and I and, and any of anybody who's friends in the Lord, uh, you investigate like, oh, yep. something's happening. Like, hey, what's going on there? Yep. You yeah. ask questions. Yeah. You ask, like, what, what was that all about? Like, uh, how you been doing? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, you got to press in. And of course, people can lie. Uh, but if you've got a good relationship, eventually you tend to pick up on things. You know, if people aren't and oftentimes in relationships, it's not that you're lying. You're just not saying it all. And they can tell. Yeah, They're you like, can tell when okay. someone's holding back. Mm -hmm. I see you're holding back there. Mm -hmm. So I think the the monitoring, I think you're right, Jimmy. Um, it's necessary if you can do this. And I think it needs to be observational and investigatory. Not in the sense that like you're scrutinizing every single, you know, thing that they ever do, mm -hmm. but there has to be a, a, a close watch on their souls and on their lives. Yeah. Because of the the danger. I mean, goodness sakes, man. This world is so not only is the world hypersexualized, uh, and you know we have—I mean, goodness sakes—it's so disturbing to see how even children are sexualized in like mainstream. Uh, I don't want media is not the right word, but like entertainment. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, it's really disturbing. It's and horrible. So, and but beyond that, then we've got the internet. And beyond that, we've got the dark web. There's like all these opportunities for people to just go down uh, the the road of depravity in the privacy of their own home. So there's gotta be, you know, monitoring would include for somebody like this, they're going to need help. They're going to need help with, uh, internet access behavior mm -hmm. if they have any. Um, and I know in this particular situation, um, there is a parole officer involved. And so the, in, in this particular situation, the parole officer is saying, listen, if, and, and, and this parole officer said, based on everything I know about this person, the years and everything, we think he could be reintroduced to your congregation. But we have certain protocols that have to be in place because if those are violated, he's going back to the can. Mm. So you've got to keep these. So they even have their own protocols in place. Um, so you got to. So there's probably, I don't know. The, maybe you're not allowed to have Internet access if you've been convicted of certain crimes. I don't I don't know. But yeah, monitoring is going to be key. And then a big one that uh, controversial. One it for is. Some reason. It is. It is. Controversial. For some reason, this <laughs> is Jimmy controversial. And I, I, don't, just like, I don't see why uh, this is a controversy. No, man, listen, it's the church family. Yep. Guess what happens in in a family? Uh, we, you, you, we, you talk about it. Yeah. When you get when you mess up and you, oh you, <laughs> you stole, you stole your mom's engagement ring that she got when she was uh, young and you sold it for drugs. Well, we're going to talk about that. Yep. We're not going to keep that secret. That's not nope. healthy. No. Nope. Um, and if there's repentance, then great. But uh, we're going to talk about it. So, the, uh, one of the issues is is did you see your mom's engagement ring? I would never. Steal well, no, I'm just. Parents. It was such a. It was such a like specific. No, my brother Dave did. Oh, okay. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. He was a peach. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> stole, stole my mom's engagement ring. Mm. I was like, man, sold it. I would never think you would. I'm like, dang, no, Joey. Man. No, no, I would listen. I listen. When I was a kid, I I stole. I stole a lot of stuff, but never from mom and dad. Mm. <laughs> Not that it makes it okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somehow make, you're like doesn't make my thieving okay. How dare you, Dave? <laughs> When I was uh, when I was in third grade, I was a new kid in my neighborhood, and uh, none of the parents would let their kids hang out with me mm -hmm. because uh, the kids all told their mom that I was stealing stuff from Frank's grocery store. Yeah, yeah, because because you were stealing. Well, I was stuff. definitely was doing that. Yeah, I was doing. I was stealing. Uh, I would steal gum and cigars, um, mostly gum and cigars. Yeah, those were the things I was stealing. Yeah, that's funny. I was stealing gum and cigarettes. See, there you go. <laughs> oh, so embarrassing. So dumb. Okay, so um, I know, like, I, I've and I've seen this elsewhere, not just with Julie Roy's reporting. Like, 
there will be a church that has, let's assume the best of intentions. This person has really messed up. We want to minister to them, but we want to protect the church. And so they have all these protocols in place. Well, they're never alone. They're always mm -hmm. chaperoned, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, all this stuff. But they don't tell the congregation that there's a person here in our midst who was convicted of a sex crime against a child. Um, and I think Jimmy and I are of, are of the persuasion that you have to openly communicate. You have to yes. be transparent with your congregation about an individual's reintroduction to the church if there has been that kind of an offense. Yep. Like, listen, there are some things. It's like, oh, this guy used to boost cars. All right, I'm not really, I'm not really worried about that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, this guy. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. This guy embezzled money from a business partner. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, if that guy was uh, trying to go into business with another member. We would probably have that conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, hey, just so you know. Just so you know, there's a bit of history here. Um, but in this situation, we, we think you, you really need to uh, inform the congregation of the individual's background. Like, what happened? Yes. Not this vague, like, well, you know, they were one time, they were arrested one time. Like, don't know. Like, let's, let's. They got themselves in a little bit of trouble. You don't have to get into all of the details, but you, they, this person is a sex offender. They, they abused a child. And by the way, it's, it's probably public information. It's, I mean, you can look up a sex offender registry. Yep. So then to not do that, you will get busted. You will get caught. And then you're going to have to answer as to why you didn't. You also, Jimmy, need, they need to explain uh, the measures that are being taken. Not only it's, it's not just about like, hey, this guy did this thing. Keep an eye out on him. It's like, hey, this guy yeah. did this thing years ago. He's been going through a process of restoration. At this point, he is desiring to get back into church and we want to help him with that. So these are the measures that we are taking as a church to ensure everyone's safety. Yeah. You're going to have to lay those out. So they, cause they're got they, they deserve to know their kids are there. Yeah. Their children are there. Now I just, the, the idea that you wouldn't want to, I, I okay. I, I try to be sympathetic to the people that wouldn't want to share. They don't want to, uh, shame this person who is repentant they don't want this person to not feel like they that, that, that they're not welcome yeah or something, that, that you know? they're hated and it's like okay well honestly uh sometimes the things that you have done uh will elicit a response from people that will make them automatically hate you I'm not saying that's right or wrong but that's going to be the response by a lot yeah. of people so it's going to take time to undo that it's going to take time people need time to process to grow um and if it's if it's appropriate in in, in their relationship to forgive or whatever but um, you, 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 I think you definitely need to communicate as, as, as much as you can so that the church has an informed thing. And really what you're doing is you're in the process here is you're assuring the whole church that the individual's participation in the church is contingent on their submission to the leadership of the church. It's contingent upon their continued compliance with the established guidelines and boundaries. In other words, you're not just saying, hey, we're watching him. We're saying like, no, no, no. If, if, if these things aren't followed, then this person will be removed. And again, I don't even know if this is possible. Yeah. We're talking ideally and we're just, we're talking here. Like this is how we work things out. <laughs> we have conversations and we pray through it and we, we talk. And the more and more I think of it, Joe, like the, let's just, for those that don't communicate, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and you might have the best of intentions. You might have the best safe, safe, you know, and the guidelines and everything else, right? But if your church is anything like ours, and your church is a friendly, welcoming, hospitable church. At some point, someone's going to invite that person over. Yep. Where are those safeguards there? That's a really good point. Right? Where are those safeguards there? This you, That's a really good point. Right? Like, Because the church is a very hospitable, welcoming place. Yeah. I mean, and if someone's alone, they're in, our, especially our congregation, our congregation looks to to include people mm -hmm. that uh uh are are you know when we look we say oh they're not married or or you know they're they're uh, like we look for ways of how do we include people so that they're yeah. they're part of the family yeah now you're inviting them into your home and you were never told yeah. where are the safeguards there how how upset would you be oh i'd be furious yeah and then all trust is gone yep and here's the thing now, full transparency on our part. Um, in the very early days of Redeemer, we did have uh, a man who was professed faith in Christ, was baptized. He had, he had long-standing relationships with a few people in the church, single guy. And, um, and he was befriended by people in the congregation and he babysat. 
And this guy uh, abused a couple of kids. And the kids were very little, but they wound up saying something to mom and dad. So mom and dad called me and, um, and we proceeded as such. The first thing we did was make sure the kids are as okay as they could be, checked in on them, made sure that they were safe. The second thing that we did was we called the authorities. We called the police yep. and we got the police involved. And this person was promptly arrested. Um, the next thing that we did was we told the church exactly what happened. Um, not in graphic detail, but mm -hmm. what happened. Here's the person that did it. Here's what happened. And, um, it, you know, here it, it didn't happen at church. It was not that that changes much, but it didn't happen at church. But, you know, um, and so here's what happened. And, uh, and then we assisted law enforcement in, you know, doing whatever they needed to do. Um, and this person is still in prison. So, uh, the, the, and by the way, the healing that those families have gone through is beautiful. Their hearts are beautiful. Um, God has done an amazing thing. Uh, so we haven't had to deal with this in terms of reintroducing anybody. And to be honest with you, this person would not be welcome at this church. No, there is not a chance. Now, um, could he be welcomed at another church? That's what we're talking about. But in this case, the damage is too severe. The, the crimes are too heinous and it would be absolutely reckless and damaging for us to try to bring that person back into this congregation with mm -hmm. those people mm -hmm. would never, would, would never do that. Um, so just so you know, like we've, we've, we've had to touch on some of this before and we've had to deal with this. And this was, I mean, goodness, this was a long time ago. Uh, a lot of the stuff wasn't being talked about, but our instinct was protect people. Yeah. Be honest. And when the church found out about this, um, it was mostly just brokenness and weeping and praying. That's what it was. Um, and by the way, for the record, you know, when I, 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 I talked with this guy a few times, but you know, between glass and, um, and, you know, shared the gospel with them, talked about like what had happened. And, um, I don't know the degree to which uh, he actually ever is, has been repentant of it, but he was very, he clearly understood what he had done. He knew that it was wrong. Um, and he knew that his life as he knew it was over. Uh, none of that makes up for anything, but you know, he understood uh, at least that much of it. And um, what I, what I did tell him is like, listen, man, I can't tell you uh, that your life is going to be easy or that you're going to, I mean, you've destroyed relationships and you've really hurt people. Mm. Um, but God can forgive you. Uh, God does offer forgiveness to all of us and you can know the Lord. You can walk with the Lord again, that, that, that or it may be for the first time, uh, that, that is, <clears throat> that is an option. So, <clears throat> you know, I did share the gospel with him a few times, but, um, I, I just felt like we should probably address that in case, uh, you know, any of our people are listening mm -hmm. who was here and they're hearing like, well, we've never had, you know, we kind of had dealt with this before, but not really, not in terms of reintroduction, but we have had to, had to address some of this, some of these elements uh, mm -hmm. in the past. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that our leadership and I'm grateful that our congregation that was healthy enough to, to proceed forth in a way that honored God and protected the sheep. Hmm. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can join the conversation by following us online on Instagram and Twitter at Doc and Devo or on Facebook slash Doctrine and Devotion. You can head to the website, DoctrineandDevotion.com. There you can contact us. You can sign up for the email blast of the store, JofoStore.com Jofo and grab some gear. How do you spell that? JofoStore. J-O-F-O. -O. Oh, see, it seems, seems really easy to me. For some reason, our knucklehead listeners can't spell that. Really? Yeah, they're like, they're spelling it like J-O-E-F-A-U-X. Joe Fo, like fake Joe. I don't know what they're doing. It's J O F O. Come on, guys. Well, we want to thank you, our all access subscriber. Thank you for your support uh, for this podcast and for what we do. This has been your banter of truth on Tuesday. You got your weekday wisdom, Monday through Friday. Now, if you've been encouraged by this and you want to share it out, please share it out. Let others know why you are an all access subscriber and that they too can support the podcast and get this commercial free exclusive content. All they have to do is click on that link in their podcast player, support this podcast, or they can go to doctrineanddevotion.com slash all access. Mm. Later. Later.